thank you all for coming um the ones who've come in reality and the ones who are listening in on zoom uh right i'll start uh, at the very beginning of the last century, in October 1901, only seven months after the death of Queen Victoria, the future novelist E.M. Forster, 1879 to 1970, arrived in Florence with his formidable mother, Lily. Uh, unlike in this photograph, he was 22, and they were on what he later called a very timid outing from England to Italy. Forster and his mother stayed briefly at the Albergo Bonciani in Via dei Pansani, but they didn't like it, no doubt it had no view, and they soon moved to the Pensione Simi at number two Lungarno delle Grazie. Later on in their Italian travels, he tripped up and broke his arm, which was put into a cast, so that his mother had to wash him like a baby after which she commented that he looked cleaner than usual. Um, like Lucy Honeychurch in A Room with a View, Forster was dismayed to discover that his landlady at the Pensione Simi had a Cockney accent. He wrote to the musicologist E.J. Dent, she scatters H's like morsels and calls me the young gentleman. Altogether, Forster stayed three times in Florence in 1901, 1902, and 1903. And during those years, he spent only a few months in Italy as a whole. So it is truly remarkable that his novels were Angels Fear to Tread, set in Tuscany, and A Room with a View, set partly in Florence, have effectively defined the region and the city for English readers. Indeed, he did not spend much longer on the Indian subcontinent and yet managed to produce his acknowledged masterpiece, A Passage to India. There is a pattern to be discerned here. Hippolyte Tain spent only eight days in Florence, yet managed to write about the city in sparkling and knowledgeable fashion. In 1909, the eccentric Sir George Sitwell wrote to his elder son, a schoolboy at Eton, my dearest Osbert, you will be interested to hear that I am buying in your name the castle of Acciaioli, pronounced Acciaioli, between Florence and Siena. The castle is split up between many poor families and has an air of forlorn grandeur. It would probably cost a hundred thousand pounds to build today. There is a great tower, a picture gallery with frescoed portraits of the owners from a very early period, and a chapel full of relics of the saints. The roof is in splendid order, and the drains can't be wrong as there aren't any. I shall have to find the money in your name, and I do hope, my dear Osbert, that you will prove worthy of what I am trying to do for you and will not pursue that miserable career of extravagance and selfishness which has already once ruined the family. Ever your loving father, George R. Sitwell. The new owner managed to prize the many poor families out of the castle, known as Montegufoni, and set about improving it. One of his improvements was a set of modernist frescoes by Gino Severini, installed in 1922. Osbert and his two arty siblings, Edith and Sir Chevrel, used the castle quite a lot as a base for excursions into Florence. Osbert died there in 1969. In April and May of 1910, the Staffordshire novelist Arnold Bennett 1867 to 1931, was in Florence working on his ambitious new novel, Clayhanger. However much he wrote in a day, and it was generally a lot, he always managed to keep up his almost daily journal. 
which by the end of his life amounted to over a million words. It provided raw material for his fiction. As a young man, Bennett had trained as a painter and his imagination was highly visual. Here is his description of Borgo Santa Croce, which runs from Via de Benci towards the Basilica. A narrow street containing six or eight ancient palaces in which doctors, lawyers, etc., live like birds in the side of a precipice. You go up to one of the porte cochere. A porte cochere is a doorway that's wide enough to admit a carriage. You go up to one of the porte cochere and see a courtyard and groined roofing and ironwork with glimpses of vast stairs and upper corridors and stories, all grim and stony. At top of some stairs, a double iron gateway. Each palace may be inhabited by perhaps a dozen families or more. Bennett was a gourmet. The delicious omelet Arnold Bennett is named after him. And in his diary, he gives an admiring description of a highly professional Florentine chef. We dined at Lappi's in the cellar in the Via Tornabuoni. Here the cooking is done in full view of the audience, each dish prepared specially for each client, all by one man, about 35, dark, personable, extraordinarily quick and graceful. If he left his recess for a moment to go upstairs, he would slide down the rail to come back again. Charcoal stove, he blew it up constantly with a fan. Sparks flew. He put on charcoal with his hand. He would fan with one hand and stir with the other. He made an omelette in a moment. Very quick, his gesture in turning it over like a pancake in the pan. Very careful and slow in making our coffee. Uh, I spent ages looking for old photographs of Italians eating in restaurants, and this is the nicest one I found, <laughs> though it's not really very relevant. The uh, Luge travel writer Norman Douglas, 1868 to 1952, who was of Scottish or Austrian ancestry, came to live in Florence in February 1917 and stayed on and off, of course he traveled a good deal, for 20 years until his sudden departure from Italy in May 1937, following a sexual scandal. Edward Hutton, another travel writer who was one of the founders of the British Institute, introduced Norman Douglas to Reggie Turner, the loyal friend of Oscar Wilde, who had arrived in Florence at about the same time. Reggie thought Norman a mixture of Roman emperor and Roman cab driver, which seems to sum up, sum up his character nicely. Norman was a master of English prose. His celebrated novel, South Wind, had appeared in 1917, and in some respects, fastidious and patrician. But he was also a heavy drinker and an unrepentant pedophile. Um, Evelyn Waugh describes South Wind as the only great satirical novel of his generation. He had a flat on the Lungano delle Grazie, which at some stage he shared with his equally louche friend, Giuseppe Orioli, the publisher of the famous uh, Lungarno series. Norman had taken a vow never to enter a church, which certainly handicapped him as a writer of guidebooks and he resolutely avoided the houses of the rich. Although he was great friends with Harold Acton, despite their 37 year difference in age, he never set foot in the Villa La Pietra. What he liked to do was meet his gossipy friends in the inexpensive restaurants that he patronized, Betty's or Cesare's or Fuzzi's in the Via Condotta. The friends included Reggie Turner, and Rebecca West. On a dark, wet, wintry evening in November 1919, the Nottinghamshire miner's son, D.H. Lawrence, 1885 to 1931, 
turned up for the first time in Florence. The bearded novelist had asked his old acquaintance, Norman Douglas, to find him some lodgings. And as soon as he was installed in them, Norman wrote to Reggie Turner to ask him if he would care to meet the author of The White Peacock and The Rainbow. Reggie said he would, and the three of them became good friends. After a while, Lawrence left for Venice, but he was back again in the spring of 1921 and checked into the Pensione Balestri, now Piazza Mentana 4. That very day, Rebecca West, Reginald Turner, and Norman Douglas all lunched together. And they decided to call on Lawrence at the Balestri. Norman said he was sure that Lawrence would be already writing about the current state of Florence. And sure enough, there he was bashing away at his typewriter. The three vis visitors fell about laughing, but Lawrence was not amused. What he had been writing that day in the Pensione Balestri was the 16th and 17th chapters of his new novel, Aaron's Rod, which came out in April 1922, a couple of months after James Joyce's Ulysses. The novel's flute-playing hero arrives in Florence and enters on a whim the Pensione Nardini, a big old Florentine house with many green shutters and wide eaves in, surprise, surprise, Piazza Mentana. He is shown into a big bedroom with two beds and a red tile floor, a little dreary as ever, but the sun was just beginning to come in and a lovely view of the river towards the Ponte Vecchio. The novelist and critic Francis King comments on this passage. It is a perfect evocation of a kind of pensione, Miss Godkins, Miss Plucknets, Madame Jenny Giacchino's, the Jennings Riccioli, the Lavellis Mark, the Bertelli Scott, in which foreigners, foreign visitors put up in the days before package tours and ensuite facilities. When I first came to Florence in 1971, I stayed for a couple of months at the Pensione Antica in Via Pandolfini, a vanished world. In Aaron's Rod, there is a virtuoso description of Piazza della Signoria, when the protagonist catches sight of the long, slim neck of the Palazzo Vecchio, up above in the air. And in another minute, he was passing between the massive buildings out into the Piazza della Signoria. There he stood still and looked around him in real surprise and real joy. The flat, empty square with its stone paving was all wet. The great buildings rose dark. The dark, sheer front of the Palazzo Vecchio went up like a cliff to the battlements, and the slim tower soared dark and hawk-like, crested high above. And at the foot of the cliff, stood the great naked David, white and stripped in the wet, white against the dark, warm, dark cliff of the building, and near the heavy, naked men of Bandinelli. One of Aaron's acquaintances in Florence is an affected young man called Francis, who talks to Aaron about the English community. Oh, they are such queer people. Why is it, do you think, that English people abroad go so very queer, so ultra-English, incredible, and at the same time, so perfectly impossible? And as for their sexual behavior, oh dear, don't mention it. I assure you, it doesn't bear mention. This is a photograph of Peter Watson, taken by Cecil Beaton. Francis and Aaron go to an all-male party where several of the guests are transparently based on real people. Thus, Algie Constable, the host, blinking like a demented owl, is Reggie Turner. Walter Rosen is the art historian and connoisseur Bernard Berenson. 
And the hard drinking, outspoken James Argyle is very obviously Norman Douglas. Well, this party is the right period, but the wrong country, it's Weimar, Germany. In a letter to Reggie, Norman had voiced his suspicions about Lawrence. He's a damned observant fellow and might be so amused by certain aspects of Florentine life as to use it for copy in some book, which would be annoying. In the event, these fears were only too justified, as we have seen. But Lawrence, the genius, was forgiven everything. He had gone on ahead of his plump German wife, Frieda von Richthofen, who joined him a few days later. Lawrence met her train at four o'clock in the morning and insisted on showing her the city straight away. Outside the station, he had one of the open carriages that were then so cheap and ubiquitous and still exist today, though they're not cheap. Frieda, who was a cousin of the flying ace known as the Red Baron, described their nighttime tour of Florence. I saw the pale crouching Duomo and in the thick moon mist, the Giotto Tower disappearing at the top into the sky. The Palazzo Vecchio with Michelangelo's David and all the statues of men we passed. This is a man's town, I said, not like Paris, where all the statues are women. We went along the Lungarno, we passed the Ponte Vecchio in that moonlight night. And ever since, Florence is the most beautiful town to me the lily town, delicate and flowery. Lawrence, here shown sitting under a Tuscan olive tree, has an interesting passage on the dawn of fascism. He writes, in the summer of 1920, I went north and Florence was in a continual socialistic riot. Sudden shots, sudden stones smashing into the restaurants where one was having coffee all the shops suddenly barred and closed. When I came back, there was a great procession of fascisti and banners. It was the beginning of fascism. It was an anti-socialist movement started by the returned soldiers in the name of law and order. Only another form of bullying. Aldous Huxley, 1894 to 1963, who had poor eyesight and looked like a willowy giraffe, came to Florence with his young Belgian wife, Maria, in March 1921. They had a baby son called Matthew, and they settled into a wing of the Villa Minucci in Via Santa Maria Montici, close to, close to Castel Montici. On the 1st of April, Aldous wrote to his father, Leonard, the flat is furnished adequately, though somewhat hideously, and we pay 150 lire a month for it, which is not much. From the western windows, we get a marvellous view, a valley sloping away from the house in the foreground, planted with olives and vines, with the church of San Miniato on the hill on the opposite side. To the right, looking down the valley, we see almost the whole of Florence lying in the plain, a sort of Oxford from Boar's Hill effect, only very much more so. You can see more or less what he means from this photograph. Aldous had known um, D.H. Lawrence during the war at Garsington, the home of Lady Ottilie Morell. And now in Florence, they became intimate friends. Huxley noted in his diary, lunched and spent the PM with the Lawrences, DHL in admirable form, talking wonderfully. He is one of the few people I feel real respect and admiration for. Chrome Yellow, a satire on the Garsington set, was published in 1921. Lady Ottilie never forgave Aldous for the caricature of her that it contained. The Huxleys returned to Florence for a month in 1923. 
and this time at the Castel Montici itself. There, Aldous wrote Antic Hay, which appeared later that year. He complained about the discomforts, the electric pump failed, and all the water had to be carried in buckets to the kitchen and the bathrooms. The architecture was ugly, recent decoration had been shoddily carried out. But again, there was the compensation of a marvelous position with stunning views over Florence and up the Arno Valley as far as the Apennines. Um, Huxley's short story, Young Archimedes, has a lyrical description of the, this view towards Florence. Looking over the low, dark shoulder of the hill, on whose extreme promontory stood the towered church of San Miniato, one saw the huge dome airily hanging on its ribs of masonry, the square campanile, the sharp spire of Santa Croce, and the canopied tower of the Signoria, rising above the intricate maze of the houses, distinct and brilliant, like small treasures carved out of precious stones. In a letter to his father, Aldous said Florence was packed with English visitors, but that he and Maria rarely ventured into town to see them. Among those they did see were Vernon Lee, John Mavrogordato, Norman Douglas, and Geoffrey Scott. Vernon Lee's real name was Violet Paget, and she had been a childhood friend of the great American artist John Singer Sargent who painted um, this wonderful portrait. She lived at Villa Palmerino. Henry James described her as far away the most able mind in Florence. Unlike many of the writers I have mentioned, her literary stock is now rising and each year sees new conferences and critical studies. Mavro Gordato achieved fame as the English translator of the Greek poet Constantine Cavafy, seen here. And by the way, Cavafy's great um, promoter uh, and, uh, and um, supporter in England at this time was E.M. Forster. Norman Douglas was at this time staying at 24 Via de Benci. This is a portrait of him by Desmond Harmsworth. He really hated most of the things that people love about Florence. Geoffrey Scott was the very lazy business partner of the hardworking landscape architect, Cecil Pinsent. He was married to Lady Sybil Cutting, the mother of Iris Arrigo. He wrote one good book on Renaissance architecture which is still in print after 106 years. Pinson created the garden at La Foce. Huxley may have liked these four people, but in general, he regarded the English colony as a sort of decayed provincial intelligentsia. At that time, it would have included the novelist and biographer Richard Aldington and C.K. Scott Moncrief the translator of Proust. Huxley was no doubt overreacting to the praise heaped on Florence by 19th century visitors when he wrote the spectacle of that second rate provincial town with its repulsive Gothic architecture and its acres of Christmas card primitives made me almost sick. Uh, in the spring of uh, 1926, Lawrence and his wife Frida installed themselves in the very rustic Villa Miranda, also known as Villa dell'Arcipresso, at San Paolo a Morciano near Scandici. When I visited it about 20 years ago, there were hens wandering in and out, and it was possible to see some decorative frescoes that Lawrence had painted on the walls of his rented house. In a letter, he noted that it took him half an hour by tram to reach the Duomo. I wonder how long it takes now. It was here that he began writing the most famous, but by no means the best of his novels, Lady Chatterley's Lover, 
first published in Florence in 1928. In this painting by Collingwood G, we see Lawrence reading from the manuscript of Lady Chatley to Reginald Turner, Norman Douglas, and Giuseppe Orioli. Including the artist, all four members of the audience were inverts, as they were then called, although the novel itself is a paean to heterosexual passion. In June that year, Lawrence visited the Sitwell's castle of Montegofoni, and in a letter to his friend, Mrs. Otway, he wrote, Sir G collects beds, room after room, and nothing but bed after bed. I said, but do you put your guests in them? Oh, he said, they're not to sleep in, they're museum pieces. Also gilt and wiggly carved chairs. I sat on one. Oh, he said, those chairs are not to sit in. So I wiggled on the seat in the hope that it would come to pieces. While he was in Italy, Lawrence made some superb translations of stories by Giovanni Verga, including Cavalleria Rusticana. To his Nottinghamshire family, he was known as Bert, but his cosmopolitan friends all called him Lorenzo. He was very robust and tended to be harsh on the less robust. Of E.M. Forster, he wrote, his life is ridiculously inane. The man is dying of inanition. After Lawrence himself died of tuberculosis in the south of France in 1931, his letters were edited by Aldous Huxley. Forster, by the way, lived to be over 90. The stammering bridge playing novelist and short story writer William Somerset Maugham, 1874 to 1965, came to Florence fairly often in the 1930s. He was friends with Arthur Acton, the owner of Villa La Pietra and father of Harold. Maugham's 1941 novel, Up at the Villa, a tale of adultery and suicide, is supposedly based on the Acton home. During the war, Arthur asked his son Harold to send him a copy of it, presumably so he could show it off to the other guests at the Hotel Trois Couronnes in Vevey, Switzerland, where he and his wife were holed up for the duration. The political climate in Italy in the 1930s obliged foreigners to take a stance. Some, like Norman Douglas and D.H. Lawrence, were stoutly opposed to fascism from the outset. Others, like Reggie Turner, were favorably disposed towards Mussolini until the racial laws came in and then turned firmly against him. Others, again, never wavered in their admiration, almost adoration, for the Duce. One such was Harold Goad, director of the British Institute for 16 years until 1939. He kept writing admiring pamphlets with titles like What is Fascism and The Corporate State. Goad retired just before war broke out and was replaced by the musicologist Francis Toy, who wasn't a fascist, but did look very like Mussolini. He was fond of rolling his eyes and sticking out his chin to emphasize the resemblance. As soon as Britain declared war on Italy, Toy had to flee and the Institute was closed down. There is not much to be said about literary foreigners in Florence during the Second World War. Like the drains at Montegofoni, there weren't any. This photo um, shows Mussolini's visit to Florence in 1930. You can see how he was acclaimed, how he was welcomed. On a return visit eight years later, he wrote in the visitor's book at Palazzo Vecchio, Firenze Fascistissima. <coughs> in 1947, Lady Keppel, who had been one of the mistresses of King Edward VII, died and bequeathed her villa Ombrellino at Bellasguardo 
to her novelist daughter, Violet Trefusis, seen here as a child. Violet liked to imply that she was the daughter of the king, but the dates make this impossible. She wrote a number of novels in English and in French. Although Violet was born in London, she can no more be considered a visitor than her arch enemy, Harold Acton. They were both of them long-term Florentine residents. In the summer of that year, the boozy Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, 1914 to 1953, came to Florence because he and his family had been lent the Villa Beccaro near Scandici. He wrote to his parents, it's on the hills above Florence, some five miles or more from the center, from the great cathedral dome, which we can see from our sunbathing terrace above the swimming pool. And I hope that sounds grand enough. It's a very big villa with huge rooms and lovely grounds, arbors, terraces, pools. There are cypresses and palms all around us in the wide green valley below with poppies among the vines and olives. Nightingales sing all night long. Lizards scuttle out of the walls in the sun. In another letter, he said that they were living on asparagus, artichokes, gorgonzola, strawberries, olive oil, and lots of red wine. To Donald Taylor, he wrote, the heat is sizzling, the wine overpowering, the villa enormous. Despite these idyllic surroundings, Dylan was not really happy in Tuscany, and he took a dim view of the local Florentine intellectuals. I like the people I don't know in the streets, but not the writers, etc., who are nearly all editors I meet in the cafes. So many of them live with their mothers on private incomes <laughs> and translate a Polinaire. Montale seems to be an exception, he wrote to Ronald Bottrell. And to John Davenport, he explained, the local writers visit us on, Sats on Sunday. To overcome the language, I have to stand on my head, fall into the swimming pool, crack nuts with my teeth, and tarzan into the cypresses. The poet Mario Luzzi was somewhat bewildered by Dylan's constant heavy drinking. Entering the Giube Rosse late of an evening, he was to be found entrenched behind a small forest of bottles, a full glass in his hand, and one wondered whether those large pale blue eyes were gazing on something ineffable or merely into vacancy. He would begin to speak, then lapse into silence, perhaps because the listener did not understand English, perhaps because what he had to say was inexpressible in any language. Dylan's biographer, Constantine Fitzgibbon, himself a great drinker, comments on this passage. If this is a good example of the writing of the Florentine intellectuals, and if many of them were so unobservant as to think that Dylan had blue eyes, his somnolence becomes more than excusable. His eyes were green. Um, Fitzgibbon, by the way, was a nephew of Norman Douglas. By mid-July, Dylan was writing to his friend Tommy Earp. I'm awfully sick of it here on the beautiful hills above Florence, drinking Chianti in our marble shanty, sick of Vini and Contadini and Bambini, and sicker still when I go bumpy with mosquito bites into Florence itself, which is a grueling museum. As Dylan Thomas made so little effort to integrate, it serves him right that he got so little from the Florentine experience. It was the only period that he ever spent abroad until the American tours that ended with his fatal trip to New York in 1953. Another visitor who made zero attempts at integration was the conservative Catholic novelist Evelyn Waugh, 1903 to 1966, who paid three visits to Harold Acton in July in the 1950s, sorry, uh, in Italy in the 1950s and 60s. 
I should now like to concentrate on a literary dinner party, a social and culinary failure that took place in Florence in April 1950, during the first of War's three visits. In the spring of that year, Harold's amusing novella, Prince Isidore, had just been published. Evelyn, whom Harold had not seen since the war, wrote out of the blue, praising the novella. What a delight Prince Isidore is, and inviting himself to stay. Evelyn spent Holy Week in Rome, where he heard mass celebrated by, in San Pietro by Pope Pius XII Pacelli, and then uh, came up to Florence to meet Harold. They dined together at the Villa Natalia on the um, La Pietra estate, which was a pensione in those days, and on the following day in the restaurant Olivero. And it was there that Sinclair Lewis, as Harold recalled in his memoirs, loped diagonally across the room to our table and hailed him as a dear old pal. Evelyn looked startled. This inauspicious beginning resulted in the painful dinner party that is described on pages 307 to 309 of More Memoirs of an Aesthete. Sinclair Lewis, 1885 to 1951, author of Main Street and Babbitt, had become the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1930 at the age of 45. He was known as Red Lewis, partly because of his political opinions and partly because of his curious, boiled looking complexion. At this time, his health was not at all good. In fact, he was to die in Rome the following year, 1951. He was trying to finish a book, was drinking a good deal, and was living in a rented house on Via Pian de Giulari, Villa La Costa. He told Harold and Evelyn that he had not given a dinner party for months, but he was very pressing that they should both come. Evelyn had by this date completely shed his fun-loving, party-going persona that had entranced Harold in the iconoclastic 1920s. In its place, he had fully assumed the cantankerous, reactionary persona of his later years. His country house in Gloucestershire, Piers Court, where he lived with his wife and six children, had a sign outside that read, No admittance on business. When abroad, he refused to speak any language but English, which he expected everyone to understand, and he was consistently rude to waiters and to anyone else who annoyed him. One example of his appalling rudeness will be more than sufficient. A friendly American lady told him how much she had enjoyed his novel Brideshead Revisited, whereupon he rolled his eyes and replied, I thought it was good myself but now I know that a vulgar common American woman admires it, I'm not so sure. <laughs> hmm. Well, this makes him sound odious, of course, but we should remember that he was much loved by a large circle of friends and that he could be spontaneously generous. In a TV interview after his death, Nancy Mitford said, what nobody remembers about Evelyn is that everything with him was jokes, everything. That's what some of the people who wrote about him seem not to have taken into account. Anyway, Harold Acton thought that in the whole of Florence, Lewis could not have chosen a more hideous, garish house in which to live. It had been built by a local fascist on the Pian de Giulari, beyond the Air Pazzi Villa. Harold found the ugliness of the rooms, furniture and pictures quite depressing, no doubt comparing them in his mind with the splendors of La Pietra. Also invited to the dinner party, together with Harold and Evelyn, was Una Lady Truebridge, who for 28 years had been the companion of Radcliffe Hall, the monocle-wearing, dog-loving authoress of the celebrated lesbian novel, The Well of Loneliness. In this photo, it's Una who's wearing the monocle with Radcliffe on the right. Um, he, this is Lewis looking rather the worse for wear. Also present was Sinclair Lewis's half-Polish secretary, 
Alec Manson and Manson's latest girlfriend, Tina Lazzarini. Lewis had met Manson in Assisi the previous year and immediately taken him on as his assistant, though to Lewis's friends, he seemed an obvious charlatan. Bernard Berenson, for instance, said of Manson, I know a minor Central European adventurer when I see one. Lewis had apparently been eating little and drinking a lot. When he wrote, he could scarcely bring himself to eat, and he was just on the verge of finishing a novel about modern Florence. Consequently, his speech was incoherent and obscure. They were offered tiny glasses of weak vermouth and a poor dinner of tepid spaghetti, veal, and sweet whipped cream cake with watered wine watered by the secretary because Lewis was apt to drink too much of it. These horrid catering arrangements evidently did not improve the mood of his guests. Their host did not touch his food and burped loudly and long several times throughout the dinner. Evelyn's face was a study as he flinched and sat back in his chair. Some of the halting and awkward conversation that took place is reproduced in the second volume of Harold's memoirs, published in 1970. He says, Evelyn flinched in his chair on his host's right with an expression of growing alarm. What is that frightful noise? He kept asking me. Red's speech was incoherent, but at length he noticed that Evelyn was fasting and he urged him to taste the veal the Specialité de la Maison. Evelyn answered severely, it's Friday. In those days, Catholics were not supposed to eat meat on Fridays. Diverted by this, Red prompted his companion, who had been an army captain serving in Trieste, to entertain us with the saga of his war exploits. I don't want to hear them, said Evelyn. Oh, but you must, they're absolutely hilarious. Tell Evelyn about the holy water font that was mistaken for a urinal. The captain, an ingenuous type, proceeded to spin his yarns, which convulsed red with guffaws interspersed with hiccups. Evelyn pressed his fingers to his ears and sat back with an air of weary resignation. Towards the climax, he turned to me and asked, has he finished? When I nodded, he removed his fingers and contemplated the tablecloth. Lady Truebridge tried to remedy the gaffe, but the dinner was a social and culinary failure. After dinner, they were taken on a tour of the house. Lewis seemed quite aware of its hideousness, but rather pleased and amused by it at the same time. And they sat in his bedroom beside the fire while he maundered on about how much he had enjoyed writing his novel. It may be bad, but it has given me a lot of fun, he kept repeating. The novel Lewis was working on was called World So Wide, his 22nd, and it was published posthumously in 1951. Here he is with Hedy Lamarr, the Austrian-American film star and inventor of a system for guiding torpedoes. According to Harold's memoirs, Red Lewis was provoked by what he took to be Evelyn Waugh's standoffishness and delivered a panegyric upon the vigor, the splendor, the creative genius of America, which was moving in the circumstances despite its platitudes. Red's bloodshot eyes bulged, his fingers trembled, clutching the chair, as he wound up with a denunciation of contemporary English literature. Evelyn reddened more from, from embarrassment than resentment, but he endured it almost patiently and politely. I suspect he was aware of the pathos underlying this defiant monologue. I can't think what got into him, said Lady Truebridge, when we escorted her home. I'm afraid poor old Red is off colour. He doesn't usually behave like that. I assure you. I rather enjoyed the latter part of it, said Evelyn. I was only afraid he might burst a blood vessel. From Paris, 
Evelyn sent a postcard. My love to Red Lewis, Mrs. Wollstone, and all stray Yanks. Catherine Wollstone was Graham Greene's American mistress, and they had been staying at the Villa Natalia. By Yanks, he means Americans in general, not necessarily ones from New England. In a letter to um, Evelyn later that year, Harold thanks him for a, a copy of his novel, Helena, and reports that Red Lewis seemed to have departed, but the Una Trubridge still plodded the Via Tonawoni, hatless and grim. And that phrase is the final ripple from the unsuccessful dinner party at Pian de Gelari, so far as I have been able to discover. In the 1950s, the left-wing Catholic novelist Graham Greene, 1904 to 1991, came several times to Florence to visit Harold Acton, who had been his contemporary at Oxford, where they had a somewhat prickly relationship. Harold slagged off Graham's poetry in the undergraduate magazine, Charwell. Writing years later to his fiancée, Graham recalled, the person I miss now is Harold. It was such intense fun, our mutual hate, and I do respect him. Although I wouldn't admit it to anyone else, his attack in, in, on me in the Charwell was the best and most awful criticism I've ever had. And my alterations I try to make to my stuff are founded on it. And much later, he wrote to Evelyn War, in Italy, we saw Harold, how nice and dear he is, and how I didn't realize it at Oxford. Graham remarked somewhere that Evelyn would chide him on his single-minded heterosexuality and would tell him that a homosexual face was a desirable attribute for a novelist, but he would not be persuaded. Graham came several times to La Pietra and several times he stayed at the Pensione in Villa Natalia, accompanied by his beautiful American mistress, Catherine Wollstone, and on one occasion also by her mother. One evening, the pair of them sent Harold a note to La Pietra, a heart with an arrow through it, drawn on Villa Natalia writing paper, and an invitation to come and drink whiskey with them. I do not know, but I imagine he accepted with, a, with alacrity. They sound to have been having such fun. Edith Sitwell, 1887 to 1964, the eldest of the three arty siblings whose father had bought the large and crumbling castle of Montegufoni, visited Florence fairly often. Her enormous jewelry and elaborate coiffures astonished the Florentines. On one occasion in January 1957, she lectured at the British Institute on modern British poetry. No doubt she read her famous wartime poem, Still Falls the Rain, in her customary incantatory fashion. Afterwards, there occurred an incident whose moral seems to be, don't mess with a sitwell. As she described in a letter, on galloped an enormous young man, and sucking down my hand like a swamp in Florida and gluing his face to mine, he inquired, do you know who I am? I said coldly that I didn't. Whereupon he said some name that I had never heard of, Hanekin or Hennekin, and said, my father told me to ask you if you remember sitting on his knee. Here she puts four exclamation marks. There was a deathly silence. I drew myself up and absolutely glared at him. The young man added, as an afterthought, as a child. I said, I never sat on anybody's knee as a child, and I have never heard of your father, and turned my back. But it was a nine days wonder in Florence. The lecture had been arranged by the Institute's director, Ian Greenlees, who, as a young man, had founded a Sitwell Society at Oxford. He was also a great friend of Norman Douglas, who, by the way, ended his days on the island of Capri in 1952. 
During Ian's directorship, a number of writers and literary figures were invited to speak at the Institute, at that time housed in the Palazzo Antinori. The eminent actress Edith Evans, famous for her role as Lady Bracknell in The Importance of Being Honest, gave a poetry reading. The novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch spoke on the exquisitely Murdochian subject, Is Moral Action Like a Work of Art? She gave the same talk in Japan, where it was adjudged a huge success, mainly because it was so abstruse as to be incomprehensible even to native speakers of English. The feminist and literary critic Lorna Sage, whom we see here at a not very advanced age, gave a lecture on the Victorian novelist George Meredith. In this slide, we see a selection of other lecturers from the Greenlees period. Clockwise from the top left, there are Mario Prats, whose name was never uttered by the superstitious, as he was thought to be a yetatore, or possessor of the evil eye. Anthony Blunt, the art historian and expert on Poussin, who was a member of the Institute's governing body, having not yet been unmasked as a traitor and a Soviet spy. The novelists Angus Wilson and David Lodge, Professor Frederick Copleston, the Jesuit and philosopher known for having engaged with Bertrand Russell in a famous and brilliant debate on the existence of God. And Christopher Fry, the dramatist and poet who spoke on the subject, the formation of a playwright himself, evidently. Aldous Huxley died on the 22nd of November, 1963, the same day as C.S. Lewis, but their deaths were overshadowed by that of President Kennedy, who was assassinated in Dallas on that day. In June, 1987, the Irish novelist and short story writer, William Trevor, 1928 to 2016, whose real name was William Trevor Cox, came to the British Institute and read two suitably contrasting stories, Teresa's Wedding and Two More Gallants. This was a memorable occasion. I believe that Trevor either owned or rented property in Tuscany, for several of his Jacobian short stories have Tuscan settings, such as Cocktails at Doni's, set in Florence. We made a bella figura when he visited the library because we were able to put on display no fewer than 31 of his well-thumbed books. And he looked very pleased. Towards the end of Harold Acton's life in the early 1990s, more or less the only visitors he would receive at La Pietra were John Pope Hennessy and Joan Haslip. The three of them would sit around giggling and gossiping for hours. Pope Hennessy was an immensely learned and um, art historian and museum curator whose magisterial pronouncements led to his being called the Pope. He lived in Via dei Bardi as a tenant of the Caponi family. He wrote a three volume history of Italian sculpture and a an exemplary monograph on Donatello. Joan Haslip produced a couple of novels and a string of frothy romantic biographies. She had been born at Villa Le Rose and lived in Bellasguardo. To her victims, she was known as Sharp Lip. I have a memory that connects her with Aldous Huxley. She told, she told me that she once asked him for some advice on pronunciation. Orders, do you say Persian or Persian? Huxley replied, neither my dear, Persian. <laughs> this is oral history. Uh, here we see her looking wistfully out of a window. All three of them, Sir Harold, Sir John, Miss Haslip, died in the same year, 1994 which for that reason 
seems to me to mark the end of an era. Thank you. No. No, stop share. Stop, stop That's it. Share. I know it's like a Zoom audience. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as always, we will go now to questions. Um, and because we've got people in the room, quite a lot, and also quite a lot of people on the Zoom, um, we'll take it in turn. So we'll start in the room. Um, and if somebody wants to ask a question, will they please come up here and uh, speak into this microphone, into, into the camera, then the people on the Zoom can see who you are. Um, keep your mask on if you can, though I found I can't speak with a mask on. So do we have anyone in the room who wants to ask a question? I'm, I'm going to start because I've, I've actually got one, which is, um, Mark, you, you, you brought the Institute into the story pretty much at the fascism and then after the war, uh, when quite a lot of the, the literary visitors were here. Um, I've he heard tell that D.H. Lawrence came to the Institute, took one look at it and walked out in the hump saying he thought it was awful. Do you have any other stories of, of the earlier writers in the Institute? Uh, uh, no, I don't. I, I, I've heard this story about Lawrence. I think it's. I think it's probably true. I mean, al although um, in in the '60s it was it was modish to call Lawrence a fascist. He definitely wasn't. I mean, in not in any political sense. Um, but I'm afraid I can't think of any other English uh, writers who came to the institute. Okay. So um, we'll, we'll go to the, the Zoom, uh, and if you would like to speak, just wave and unmute yourself, and then, then we'll hear you. Any questions from the Zoom? Nobody in the Zoom? Nobody in the room? Not a lot of questions tonight. No? Or comments. Or comments. Personally, I think Mark had enough material there for a series of a dozen lectures. <laughs> um, it, it was very much a survey and absolutely fascinating. So many important writers and interesting people were here. Um, so perhaps we'll commission you to do a series. <laughs> We've got any else with it. Um, okay, just, so oh, here we are. Jennifer, go. I just, I suppose he didn't answer the question is why there were, I, I don't know if R is, is correct, but there certainly were so many renegade Brits in Florence on the prowl. I mean, they, they, they you know, uh, pedophilia is not something to be um, ignored. So these people were accepted in society, and I don't understand why. Yeah, the, there's a new, there's a new book uh, by Rachel Hope on Norman Douglas in particular concentrating on his pedophilia. And it's seen from a um, um, 21st century point of view, because um, this is something that put people off writing biographies of him. One biography appeared in 1974, um, at a time when there was a, a, you know, comparative sexual freedom in publishing. But before that and after that, biographers shied away from him. I, th I don't think it's true, however, that his, his writings have suffered much, despite his, his unpleasant reputation. His writings mostly are still in print. That's Douglas. Um, any more for any more? Um, yes, uh, Julia, you had your hand up. Uh, unmute yourself, please. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, oh sorry, I'll unmute Julia, please. We can't hear you, Julia. So um, you unmute. Oh, there you are. Such a wonderful tapestry of um, English eccentrics, etc. Um, but this goes back to the sort of the English milord of the uh, Grand Tour. And then what I found is in the 19th century, you get women doing the Grand Tour and you get black women from America like Sarah Parker Raymond and Edmonia Lewis. And um, I've observed firsthand the kind of this society continuing in Rome with my father and other writers there. And it had the same flavor. 
of um, being accepted when it was really being quite outrageous, um, not following the mores of the normal society. And in a sense, it was, you know, in La Dolce Vita, where uh, you get, those were the real characters that were living in Rome at that time, who are doing the seances and so forth. You would actually see those actors in the street in their ordinary, well, their extraordinary lives carrying on. Um, what I felt about all of this is that these were people who were very aware of sort of, in a sense, creating a kind of theater and using Florence as the backdrop to it. I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, there is something of a, in, a, in a way charming and creative, but at the same time, sort of out of bounds and so on. Mm. Well, the, the, the group of writers and intellectuals that um, Huxley was so scornful about in the in the twenties. I mean, there, there have been groups like this. Um, I think um, uh, in every decade in Florence. Um, I, 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 I never know whether it's true that they're carrying on the the grand tour um, tradition. Um, um, but by the mid nineteenth century, there were still plenty. There were plenty of people either visiting or settled in Florence, as we know. And, and writers seem to have been a, 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 a high proportion of these. Mm. Right. Um, Simon. Any more for any more? In the room? Yes, we've got one. Will you come up and, and use the microphone so everyone can see you? Sorry, this is rather a banal question. Um, there was Arnold, someone, one of the earlier, one of the first writers you mentioned. What was his name? Arnold Bennett. All right, you talked about the Bennett om om omelette. Yeah. Any idea about the recipe and preparation of it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's. It, uh, mm. uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. The, the omelette Arnold Bennett is very delicious. It's, um, uh, it involves haddock um, and, and cream. And um, uh, on the internet, you can find a, a whole lot of recipes. Um, somebody in particular recently did a research to see for the absolute best way of making omelette Arnold Bennett. And, and um, it was very convincing to me. But as I say, had a cream and lots of eggs. They're the main ingredients. Mm. Okay, um, so we're going to wind up unless anyone has got something that they want to ask or contribute. Um, so before I thank Mark, I'm going to put up my weekly appeal for help. Um, not help, but uh, uh, your support is much appreciated because, of course, during this difficult time of COVID, um, the Institute's uh, finances are taking a bit of a hammering. So if you're in the room and haven't already, please drop a note in the box on the way out. And if you're on Zoom and haven't already, Just Giving is there, and we greatly appreciate um, donations for whatever you feel comfortable with. It will help us keep this season of lectures and other activity going through uh, this long, dark winter, which we're just starting. So thank you very much, everybody. Nice to see you, and we'll see you all again next week for Jamie Boudreau's visit to Settignano. Thank you. Good night.